just give me a thumb up uh dr vijay there is a sound kindly from uh yeah from here definitely uh i request all participant to mute your mic should i start sadak sir yes sir yes sir you all right uh there is one uh, background uh, sound is coming up just see to that if possible okay uh so welcome to all of you uh, myself uh, pravin jakta assistant professor of dy patil uh, university school of pharmacy uh, we are conducting a various series of webinar uh, in this series uh, today's webinar is on diverse career opportunity and broad scope of toxicolo toxicological sciences and for this particular webinar we have two eminent speaker uh, right from usa so we will get a very much insight about the toxicological studies which are there at usa so let me introduce to our today's speaker the first speaker is dr vijay more uh, dr vijay more completed his phd in pharmacology and toxicology in 2013 from university of rhode island and then completed post doctoral fellowship at reputed national institute of health during which he was awarded by fellow award for research excellence for his research on toxicology and blood brain barrier then he worked in investigative uh, toxicology at merck pharmaceutical company and then joined selegin and brestol mayer squibb in non clinical development dr more has uh, published 18 peer reviewed research paper delivered numerous platform presentation and acted as mentor for post doctoral fellow in at nih dr prajakta shimpi is a, another speaker for our today's uh, session uh, dr prajakta shimpi completed her m at ndp college of pharmacy nasik and then joined phd program at university of rhode island after phd she has worked in multiple popular cosmetic companies including l'oreal and avon currently she works at church and divide consumer product company dr shimpi has received multiple presentation award from society of toxicology aaps uh, that is american association of pharmaceutical sciences and gordon research conference her phd research in toxicity of plastic bottles leaching chemical bisphenol a was published in official journal of national institute of environmental health sciences so this, this uh, list is not ending they have many accolades into their account uh, both uh, uh, they are husband and wife and it is really very uh, good opportunity to have both a resource person at one place so we will get uh, every much possible insight of the topic Uh, so if uh, our doctor uh, our principal dr rakesh somani sir if he is in um, webinar right now um, i i'm will... there i'm there don't worry yes <laughs> so i request uh, sir uh, to have few words about today's webinar yeah so uh, good afternoon of course uh, uh, we are in india so it's noon so uh, i don't know what is time at your end so morning good morning good okay okay so good morning to you both of you so uh, it's really a great pleasure to have both of you uh, on this particular platform today i mean probably this is our first event when uh, uh, husband and wife both are our resource person and uh, you know talking on some something interesting that is toxicology because as i understand that uh, uh, pharmacological action of a drug is more important no doubt about it but more than that the toxicology is important to understand the toxicity perspective of a drug molecule before bringing it into the market that is more important that is how 
safety aspect of a drug molecule are looked into uh, most uh, seriously rather than the biological activity and that's why this to topic itself is very very important so uh, uh, just to introduce you our family uh, we at gy patil university school of pharmacy in mumbai uh, are uh, conducting two programs that is diploma in pharmacy and degree pharmacy we have been established in 2019 and uh, this is our very second year of course we are expanding slowly steadily and we have very vibrant and dynamic team of our faculty members who have been uh, day in out uh, involved into motivating our students giving them something new so today's webinar is also uh, such kind of a, an endeavor from our faculty member uh, mr pravin jagtap to bring you people on this platform and to give something new to the student community and uh, so uh, particularly uh, since last uh, this pandemic uh, era right right from march 2020 onward we have been conducting lots of webinars on the different topics of the pharmaceutical uh, uh, research and this topic was not touched so i am really happy that uh, mr jagtap has taken uh, efforts to bring you people here both of you here and i am thankful to you in my personal capacity as well as on behalf of the college that you could spare your valuable time and we request you to please uh, stay in touch with us uh, this is just a beginning we have to do lot of work collaborative work in future we are available for you at any point of time and so we expect Uh, such kind of personalized touch from you also thank you so much and i am keeping this uh, forum open to both of you to take the uh, deliberations further thank you uh, thank you sir uh, now i request to start the session you are voice is starting of the session i yeah uh, before starting of session i request participant if you have any question please post into a chat box thank you over to you dr vijay okay uh, all right uh, first of all thank you so much dy patil university college of pharmacy somani sir and jagtap sir for uh, extending this invitation we are very happy to talk to you know uh, early career scientists uh, students youngsters this is very important that uh, we are able to share some of our experiences along with giving some technical information about the field of toxicology so i'm very happy uh, to do this and uh, also i checked out the facebook group and the website for the dy patil university admissions office and the webinars that are posted are amazing uh, i went through few of the recordings as well as i attended some live very very amazing topics and some very renowned speakers so i feel uh, very honored to be uh, put among those uh, speakers so thank you so much and i'm going to share my screen now Uh, and alongside me is Dr. Shimpi, so she's just gonna say hello. Hi, and thank you so much. I will join once uh, Dr. Mori will complete his presentation. Oh. Okay, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Uh, I hope you are able to see it. So, yes, we can see. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so. Uh, the topic we have chosen here is the diverse career opportunities and scope of toxicological sciences so i am going to directly dive into a topic of toxicology so toxicology in a very simple language is the study of poisons that's a very basic understanding uh, for a layman to understand what is toxicology just basically study of poisons but what is poison right understanding poison anything can be poison if you give it enough amount like drinking too much water can kill you so anything can be poison so no chemical agent is entirely safe and no chemical agent is entirely harmful it depends on the dose how much and it depends on the rate of exposure at what rate you are getting it these cartoons here uh, do a good job of explaining that concept dose and rate of exposure somebody suppose i am standing down here and jagtap sir is pouring a, 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 a bag of grains on me but if he is doing a job of slowly pouring it over me he can pour 10 10 bags and nothing will happen to me however if he just drops the whole bag at once uh, the outcome will be very different and you can understand that is the core understanding of toxicology where in at what rate i am getting exposed and the dose so and here uh, i have the uh, sign this sign here is the sign of a pharmaceutical sciences pharmacy in general but i uh, like to also think that this is basically a snake putting its venom in the cauldron so that also signifies a sign of toxicology so 
the study of poisons is the basic definition of toxicology. What we do on a day in day out basis is the modern toxicology. Now modern toxicology is not only studying the negative effect of chemical or physical agent on the living system, but it is also the mitigation or prevention of those effects, adverse effects on the body. So these are two contrasting forces. And that is why the basic understanding of uh, modern toxicology involves mechanism of understanding the adverse effect, developing the safer drugs, as well as chemical risk assessment that are not only used in drugs, but other products. Then treatment of chemical exposure, and of course, safe food and water supply. So modern toxicology uses chemicals as a tool to understand molecular and cellular biology of our body. So studying toxicology also gives us better understanding of how our body reacts to all these different chemical instincts that may hurt us. Uh, so why toxicology matters? This is a very important slide because these are the examples of incidences that has happened. Uh, I'm taking particular examples of India because those uh, I felt that uh, audience in India will know more about. So 1984, the one year before I was born, that was Bhopal gas tragedy. It was one of the biggest toxicology incidents. Uh, thousands of people ended up losing their life. And what happened is, Union Carbide, an American company, was operating in India, and there was a release of a poisonous gas, uh, methyl isothiocyanate, which ended up hurting a lot of people. Uh, and the uh, company, of course, faced a lot of backlash. As early as May 2020, uh, this year, during this lockdown, there was a gas leak in a factory uh, in southern part of India. Uh, styrene gas was released. Now, this was an incidence of a lower magnitude. Only 11 people were there. So you, you tend to think that, okay, this must be a minor incident. But 500 to 1,000 people were exposed to this gas and they didn't get hurt. Maybe got a little bit sick uh, for a few days and they got better. But this tiring gas that was released, we have to understand, it is a neurotoxin, affects your brain signaling system. So the people who were exposed now, but they did not get too much sick or just a little bit sick, but didn't lose their life right now, we have to follow those up as a toxicologist for many, many years to come because neurological effects don't happen in one day or do not happen quickly. So it's a very significant uh, incident. And that's why the reason I'm giving these examples is toxicology is a part of our day-to-day -day life. So let me get into my specialization in toxicology, which is drug safety in pharmaceutical research and development. So this is a very important slide and I'm going to explain the technicality of it. It's easy to understand, but just looks scary. So let me go through it. So uh, basically here, what I'm talking about is drug development is a, when you are making new drug is a complicated process. We don't start with one compound and one compound goes to market. We start with thousands of compounds and then one compound ends up in a market. So a lot of compounds along the way, a lot of drug molecules, candidates along the way drop out. For example, now in this COVID pandemic, we are listening about uh, hearing about the vaccines, right? Some of the vaccines are dropping in preclinical studies. Some vaccines are progressing to animals. So there are reasons because of which drug fail. One of the biggest reasons of failure of drugs during the development is this blue colored pie chart, which is safety. It means toxicology. So in a preclinical phases, early phases, if 100 compounds are failing, out of those 82 of them are failing because of safety reasons, because of toxicological reasons. As we move along into the clinical phases, 62%, 35%, and even in the late clinical phases, safety still remains an important reason for the failure of the candidates, attrition of the candidates during the drug development. So based on this, two things are very clear. One is, what do you think is the most high stakes, high responsibility job in biopharma? And I use the word most because I'm a toxicologist, I'm a little bit biased, but it's one of the most high stakes jobs in a biopharma research because a lot is riding on how toxicologist is doing his job because our job is not, along with curing the disease, we have to make sure the patient doesn't get any bad effect because of medication. So, in a very uh, basic way, I'm going to explain how the drug development process works. So there is a target identification and validation. 
Well, so you would think that how is toxicologist involved such a early uh, stages of drug development? Because we, suppose we are treating a disease like diabetes or looking for a medication for mitigation of diabetes. One of the first things we think about is, okay, we have to reduce the blood sugar level. So what do we target a glucose transporter? Do we target a insulin uh, receptor? Things like that. So target identification and validation, the computational safety is involved early on because we have to identify whether the inhibiting that target is going to cause any bad effect or not and how much inhibition to do. So computational safety screenings happen very early on and toxicologist is involved. Then there is a lead screening and lead validation. So lead compound is basically a compound that we, we are choosing the compound, which compound is good, which chemistry is good and which compound should go forward. During this phase, there are lots of two-dimensional and three-dimensional in vitro toxicology screenings. And some of the models that are used in this early discovery screening of toxicology are fascinating. There are 3D printed tissue. So imagine working with a liver, this small liver in a Petri dish, like, like a one centimeter big liver in a Petri dish. It functions just like your liver. And that's in a dish. So in vitro toxicology is amazing, branch. There are some organ on chips, which are basically, you, you can have a whole body set up on a chip and you would test our medicines on that. These are fascinating fields. And I'm happy to discuss more offline if someone is interested in those kind of tools, understanding. Then comes the preclinical development. This is a critical stage because this is when we start investing into small and large animal toxicology testings. And there's multi-organ pathology. We give a drug, suppose a drug is supposed to treat your heart, but we don't only look at the heart. We give a drug to animals and we look at all the organs, heart, kidney, liver, you know, every organ, because we have to make sure that, okay, it's helping heart, but is it hurting other organs? So, and the dose projections. So and up to this stage, the drug has not gone into people, human beings. It has got, only gone into animals and in the cell petri dish models. Now, when it goes into people, what dose to use, right? In the clinical development, what dose can be used? And that power, Dose projection power lies with two people only. One is a toxicology representative on a drug team, and the second one is a drug metabolism pharmacokinetic representative. That is a very responsible job a toxicologist has to perform. And then, of course, during the clinical phases, clinical adverse event monitoring, and after the drug is released in the market, say phase four, after release in the market, also we have to make sure whether the drug uh, is causing any problems in the populations once it's being marketed. So, toxicology is involved all along. And the early phase toxicology is generally regarded as discovery toxicologist and the late phase is development toxicologist. And then we have pharmacovigilance where the drug safety officers are involved. So let me give you one example, sort of like an anecdotal story that everybody can understand even without a pharmacy background is one of the drugs, thalidomide. This was a very famous, uh, for, for wrong reasons, famous uh, theory of a drug toxicity. So one of the drugs, thalidomide, was discovered in 1953 in Germany. Now, the drug was very good in treating insomnia, sleeplessness, so sleep pill, sleeping medication. In 1957, they started marketing that. In 1957, they also started marketing for emesis because it prevented the vomiting effect. So it became naturally very popular in pregnant women because pregnant women have this morning sickness and the drug became very popular. So within a short period of time, the drug became coming to market to become very popular and marketed in 42 countries, including entire Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, or many countries. But back then, this was long, long time ago. So the regulatory framework, the, the understanding of scientists was that when a baby is in mother's womb, it is protected by a blood placental barrier. And even if mother takes any chemical meditation and medication, her boom is not affected. That was the understanding of scientists at that time. But what ended up happening is there were reports of babies born with stunted limbs. In uh, Germany, nearly 10,000 babies of uh, women who were taking this medication born with stunted limbs. It was a very unfortunate incidence and it still took some time. So 1961, the drug was taken off the market. And since then, United States FDA started managing that you have to perform the this toxicity, reproductive toxicity screening. So the reason I'm sharing this story is because the regulatory agencies like FDA in all the countries, right? US FDA or European agencies or Indian agencies, they have learned through these experiences. And 
So they started mandating one screening at a time and that's how these things have evolved. And this kind of incident, there are fewer chances of happening it today. So thalidomide turns out inhibits angiogenesis and I don't want to get too much technical here, but it inhibits this compound, prevents the formation of blood vesicles to the rapidly dividing tissue. Now taking advantage of this mechanistic toxicology observation, what happened is Celgene, the company for which I work today, ended up developing a blood cancer drug. So same drug that was causing problems in pregnant women with little modification ended up being a blockbuster anti-cancer drug because in cancer, you want to prevent the blood vessel formation in a rapidly dividing tissue. So let's now try to dive into career path because that's the topic of the webinar, right? So in, because of the biopharmaceutical research in the developed countries like United States and Australia and European Union primarily, and in the next slide, I'm gonna talk about India as well. Uh, there are some differences there. So each sphere here, each sphere represents the number of opportunities. So biotech and big pharma is the biggest sphere here, which means majority of the toxicology jobs primarily lie in the biotech and big pharma industry. Uh, then there's preclinical contract research organizations. These are the relatively smaller companies to medium sized companies who take the contract of performing some of these animal and some in silico studies from the big, uh, big pharma. Then there is 3D tissues, organ on chip, in vitro screening, outsourcing companies. They have some toxicologies in silico that Dr. Shimpi is gonna to touch base upon later on in the presentation. There is a big chunk of jobs also located in the academic research, like postdoctoral fellowships, and then research assistant uh, professors, and uh, a lot of grant structure. Then regulatory agencies also hire toxicologists. Sometimes even hospitals have some toxicologists on staff. Now let's come to India. Comparison between the Western countries and India is a bit difficult to do because our drug development industry setup is a bit different in the sense that preclinical CROs, contract research organizations, uh, hire a big chunk of toxicologists in India to my understanding as uh, based on talking to folks in India as well as reading some papers. So in, uh, in India, the pharma uh, innovation model is a bit different, more on the generic side. There are some new, leader, uh, new uh, companies that are coming up, established companies that are now developing the innovation model. But as of now, preclinical CROs, so contract research organizations, so companies here contract out our studies to India. Then in silico toxicology, some of the new companies are coming up and there is academic research. If this bubble is also growing, uh, some uh, reputed places are uh, uh, like, you know, uh, IITs and NIPERS and CSIRs. These institutions are now developing bigger toxicology programs. And there is the regulatory agencies in India. They also have toxicologies. So I'd like to grab your attention to these, uh, especially for students, uh, to go through these papers. Toxicologic pathology in multicultural world, especially India. This paper was published 10 years ago. And this paper was published a couple of months ago, the contract research organizations. This paper, the top one, compares what is the research situation in India versus China. This is important paper because India has a lot of advantages, specifically language advantage, and specifically the dedication to work and sort of like a, the talent advantage. The raw talent in India is much better. And you, you read this paper and you're gonna realize that. So the, uh, the countries like India are, increasing their opportunities for toxicology careers. So it, it's amazing to see this difference in 10 years, what has happened in India and how the research landscape has changed and it has changed in a good direction. So educational qualifications, right? So suppose uh, today me and Dr. Shimpi are trying to inspire to become a toxicologist, but how are you gonna be one? So toxicology, majority of the toxicologists working in the industry as well as academic circles, mostly have doctoral degrees, so PhDs, but don't be intimidated by that because there are some opportunities for masters and bachelors as well for the associate level scientists. And backgrounds can be very diverse. You don't have to have only pharmacy background. If you have pharmacy background, you are very well prepared to be a toxicologist. However, even if you don't have pharmacy background, like you have basic sciences, like biology, zoology, or biochemistry, chemistry, even all the way up to engineering, molecular engineering background, you can still become a toxicologist. Uh, so this, there is a wide variety of expertise that is needed to become a toxicologist. So this uh, is an interesting slide. 
Now, this is a little bit old data, uh, comes from 2007. How much money can a toxicologist make? And I, I know that discussing salary and discussing finances, is, is, it's an unusual and a tacky thing. But I like to believe that if I tell you, then it's, it can act as a motivator, especially to early career scientists, to students, that, OK, there is a great, vast opportunity here. So for example, these different colors represent different degrees, and this cross is the median salary. But so basically, even if with no experience, if with a doctoral degree, you are starting with a substantial amount of salary. And as your experience grows, there is no limit to how much you can make being a toxicologist. And not everybody is going to make same, but what I'm trying to tell here is that there is a lot of opportunity and is a good career field to be in. So getting a pharmacy, bachelor of pharmacy, MPharm, and then getting into PhD in toxicology is something definitely you should think about, especially uh, I'm appealing to the bachelor's and a diploma of pharmacy students and MPharm students and also other backgrounds. So for the next part, now I'd like to hand over the presentation to Dr. Shimpi, who is a cosmetic and consumer product safety specialist. So Dr. Shimpi, uh, if you could uh, start your part of the presentation and then later on, I'll come back for the conclusion and uh, for the uh, question and answer session. Uh, thank you, Dr. More. As Dr. More uh, described about the, how important is the toxicology field in the pharma industry. But my questions to all of you is that, is this toxic effect only associated with the people who are taking the prescribed medication? How about the human being that those are not sick or how about the healthy human being? Are those, are those population is also at the risk having a toxic effect? Let's take an example. So for example, when we wake up in the morning, how many things we do in the morning, right from brushing our teeth, doing bath, shaving, and using multiple skin products, including shampoo, conditioner, color cosmetics, lipstick, even our mom, or when we clean up the house, we use many chemicals, including bleach, and whoever likes the pet, they also have the pet care products, right? So if we consider the broader scenario, normal human, uh, human being also get exposed to multiple products, which has a complex mixture of chemicals. So do you think like we can also need to think about the impact of toxicology on normal human being? And if I can divide these products into roughly different product category, I can say there are cosmetics and personal care, medical device, food beverage, and other products. Let's start with the medical device. So the definition of medical device is that diagnosis, which intended for use for diagnosis of disease, mitigation, cure, or prevention, right? But the important difference between the medical device and the drug medicines is that drug medicine acts through the pharmacological action, how medical devices does not achieve its primary purpose through any of the chemical reaction. And again, if we misconception that the medical device is only used by physician or surgeon, so it's not like that. Because medical devices have classified into multiple product categories, depending on the risk of those devices. So for example, class one medical device, which is at very low risk, and the examples are the adhesive bandage that we put on, on our skin when we get injury, or even the electronic spin brush. Class two medical device have the low risk, and the examples are the needle, contact lens, condom, personal lubricant, and that need pre-approval, not the pre-approval, some of them need the pre-approval by the regulatory agency, but definitely need to notify them before coming the um, product in the market. Next category is the class three, which is like a high risk. An example is the heart wall or the coronary stents, where we need to put uh, actually implant those medical device into the body. And uh, these are just a cartoon. So for example, now Apple Watch, right? So Apple Watch also classified as a class two and which near the toxicologist to assess the safety of the Apple Watch on our health. So, how the medical devices come into the market, same as Dr. Moore explained, and all of you may know that the drug, when they come into the market, it has the multiple stages. Similarly, the medical devices go through the multiple phase. For example, the product research phase, product development phase, then regulatory decision, product launches, and post-market monitoring. And the toxicologists play an important role into all of these phases. 
for example when the products is under the research phase we have to consider what are the different raw materials that are going to use then in product development phase we have to design and implement biocompatibility testing for safety design verification packaging material safety assessment review the labeling and also claim support also safety department is responsible to respond to fda if some questions is arised and definitely to do the adverse event monitoring and answers to the consumers if we get any questions related to their uh, reactions on the skin or any other body body organ and why is important because safety decision or the biocompatibility uh, safety testing decision is taken care by the toxicologist depending on for example this chart is just the uh, symbolic of how we decide which test we need to do because in order to determine the toxicity there are multiple batteries of the test available like cytotoxicity skin sensitization skin irritation and genotoxicity so depending on how much contact is going to happen in our body these different tests we have to decide let me give you an example of the recent products that i worked at the church and do it uh, currently as a product safety toxicologist so i basically worked on the uh, women's health and sexual health products including pre-seed fertility friendly lubricant trojan condom and refresh vaginal odor eliminating gel all these comes under the class 2 medical devices so as i mentioned earlier there are different biological uh, biocompatibility safety testing which is designed by the international standard organization include so for all of these products i conducted the cytotoxicity sensitization irritation acute systemic toxicity right and as a toxicologist i am responsible to review the protocol if something goes wrong with the test results they need to go back and to determine what are the different etiology like factors that is coming up with having not a uh, proper results but this job doesn't stop there we have to also think about the different safety testing that is important in order to support the claims right so for example if this product have the fertility friendly claim right so we have to think whether we need to conduct some of the sperm survival assay some of the mouse in vitro fertilization assay some chromatin structure assay and all those clinic there are clinical team who does this assays but toxicologists need to support all these process or the all these assays like how much concentration of product we need to use at what level so this is the overall role of the toxicology in medical device then another example is about the pregnancy kit right so if this is even though this is the class 2 medical device but do we really need all those tests again i would say it depends on the exposure that human get while applying or using these medical devices so after taking the uh, overall role of toxicologist i would just like let, let you know there are so many key players in the uh, medical device industry for example there is a uh, johnson and johnson ethicon roche so all these medical devices industry definitely give opportunity to the scientists to work as a toxicologist in order to support their safety of products so after the medical device i would like to uh, give you an uh, overview about a very broad product category which is the cosmetic and personal care which includes so many products including skin care oral care baby care color cosmetics even personal care include the vitamin mineral and dietary supplements so let's 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 see how many players are there in cosmetic industry right these are just again the symbols of that overall depth of the industries that are available in the market including like you 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 have heard about the l'oreal then there is a coty then unilever procter and gamble and even like for example there are so many brands that uh, frankly speaking when i joined l'oreal i even did not know like garnier is the brand of l'oreal so there are thousands of the brands under one company that needs the uh, toxicologists in order again to support their uh, safety of the products and then definitely i would like to take the example very famous example here to explain how important the toxicology job and which is very at a high stake job let's take an example of jnj which uh, who recently paid millions of dollar against the lawsuit of the ovarian cancer so as and this jnj baby products are still used extensively i think back, uh, in india but uh, when this kind of incidents happens in the industry who is the first department who get questions 
definitely it's the safety department and toxicologist and there are so many questions raised when this kind of incidents happen for example why there is this type of cancer happening that the inhalation exposure is going to get to the woman when they are applying the baby product for their babies what are the different contamination is it the talc responsible or the asbestos which is the impurity that is there sorry that is present in the talc is responsible and how are the different sensitive method so toxicologists need to work with the cross functionally with the analytical team also with the different biological events that is happening because of the exposure and then cosmetic uh, so as i said like there are multifunctional role of the toxicologist including finding potential contaminants in raw material assessment of ingredient final product safety assessment then writing including claim substantiation same as a medical device including the regulatory watch on ingredients then cosmetovigilance again considering what are the adverse event that is happening because after marketing the products then there are directions like keep out of the reach children and so for example now currently i'm working on one of the baby products and the claim here uh, tear free or newborn claim so how can we substantiate those claim the claim substantiation clinical studies and toxicology are very functions all together so uh, sorry to interrupt uh, there is voice uh, breaking up yeah you can talk oh sorry yeah now you it's good yeah yeah sorry so uh, even though cosmetic industry is not tightly regulated by fda but definitely there are the regulations including the european regulations and uh, fda and c act which is the federal drug uh, food drug and cosmetic act which has the control over cosmetics even though we don't need their approval before coming the mark product into the market but definitely eu eu regulation is widely accepted by most of the uh, international companies and the important part about the eu regulation <laughs> is that since 2013 they prohibited the use of animal testing on a cosmetic products and which makes the cosmetic industries more challenging because as we see in the pharma company right the so process development is studying in in vitro then in vivo like a rodents and then human right but in the cosmetics we cannot use the animal test in order to bring the products into the market so that is very challenging and very good i feel like as a toxicologist it's really a good of opportunity and definitely there are some of the guidances that is available including the scientific committee on consumer safety which is uh, accepted guidance for all the toxicologists so briefly the uh, i would like to just briefly give you the technical background how the risk assessment happens in a cosmetics so risk assessment is basically a scientific systemic scientific uh, characterization of potential adverse event or adverse effect that is going to pose because of the uh, hazardous material of the uh, property of the material so it has the four different stages the first is the hazard identification so is basically the intrinsic property of the ingredient so for example when i am reviewing the lipstick i there are like i would say average 10 to 15 ingredients are present in the lipstick so as a toxicologist i need to review what are the intrinsic hazard property of those ingredients whether those are causing carcinogenicity genotoxicity reproductive toxicity and all these i need to review from existing preclinical clinical data what is the uh, history of the safe use of those ingredients followed that i my responsibility is to determine the dose response which is like acceptable exposure level uh, means like below which we are safe like not we means like a consumer that going to use that cosmetic products are safe after that the most important part is the exposure assessment as i said there is a no rodent studies are available so in order to estimate the systemic exposures for example now if i am putting the lipstick on my lips how much it is going to get in my body and what is going to happen and it depends on the dermal absorption so for lipstick how much is going to get into it is going to 100% absorb through lips what are the oral absorption in case of perfume or deodorant is there any inhalation absorption also it depends on the frequency of use amount of products so these are the different factors that we need to consider while doing the exposure assessment and definitely all these three together to get the risk characterization 
and then transformation of the what are the rodent data by considering multiple factors into the human data so this is the all technical slide with about the toxicity and definitely those risk assessment is supported by some of the clinical studies including skin sensitization safety in use test or eye irritation but definitely i would like to note here is that most of them are about local toxicity next i would like to grab your attention about the new ingredients in the cosmetics so again as because of the three are like a reduced refined and replacement of the animal studies and banned of the animal studies we have to think what if there is a no data available of any of the ingredients in the literature what are the different approaches we should think so first is important is the in vitro approaches using the different cell models and there are multiple uh, test methods that are being developed so far in the in the Uh, yeah, wo voice is not coming up. Yeah, yeah, now it is okay. Okay, so, okay, so, uh, and again, I would like to note here is that when we def uh, when we design the in vitro studies, we definitely know the mechanism of uh, toxicological events, and that's why the pharmacy background for me, as I am coming also from the pharmacy background, it definitely helps because when we study in the pharmacy, we study the different biological events that are happening uh, in our body. so that helps to develop the in vitro studies so i would like to give, give an example for example if product is having a skin sensitization right so first question is how the sensitization happens so first like product is going to put on is there any physical and chemical reactions on my body what are the different immuno cells that is going to get activated after putting a product on my body so these are the different mechanism that we need to know and then again we need to have the computational toxicology background but sometimes these in vitro studies do not give us the potency of chemical like up to how much percentage of that chemical is going to have the sensitization effect and what if there are different methods which are available and which are giving us a, a ambiguous ambiguous results like one is saying yes one is saying no in that case we need to also do the integrated testing strategy approaches and there are different models nowadays are developing in order to get the different test methods combining with the in vitro in silico and physical chemical properties so far the research has been done based on the local toxicity again but how about systemic toxicity if there is a no noel data available from the rodent how are we going to put uh, consider the systemic toxicity definitely this is there is a decision making approach this is just a technical slide but what i wanted to grab your attention is about all the current methods that is available for example threshold of toxicological concern which is based on the structural class of compound and there are no decision making but definitely there are some of the limitation where the ttc approach cannot be applied so in that case we need to consider what are the different key events that is happening because of the uh, because of the interaction of toxic chemicals over the body and when we study about these different biological events and when we combine that with the toxicokinetics modeling we come up with the different in vitro approaches and there are so many consortium projects that is initiated by the international agencies and definitely a consumer product companies including png l'oreal unilever those are coming up with these collaboration projects and which encourage the scientists to develop their ideas for this non animal method technology so along with that it's not only toxicology just do the uh, ingredient safety assessment or the product safety assessment but we have to also consider what are the impact of this toxicological ingredients not toxicological i'm sorry but the new ingredients on the environment so when i conducted uh, when i worked with the one of the new ingredient i have to consider is this a new uh, ingredient is going to bioaccumulate into environment is this going to be a persistent what is the aquatic toxicity of this environment it's and along with that we have to also consider the packaging for example you have heard about the recycled plastic right so nowadays industries are uh, more prone to use the post 
recycle plastic container means like uh, when we are throwing the plastics into the garbage there they do the processing and then we can use those recycled plastic again back for our new packaging so as a toxicologist we have to think whether this recycled plastics how is the impact of those on the safety and stability of the product so overall, I would like to say here is that there are multiple opportunities in order to work in the consumer and the cosmetic industry as a toxicologist in order to make the product more safe, sustainable, keeping people and the environment safe, reducing our environmental impact. And then again, as I mentioned, there are so many evolving opportunity in the cosmetic safety and which is again, not limited only cosmetics, but this can be applicable also in the pharma in order to get from in vivo to in vitro and in silico methods. So this is all cosmetics. And as I said, cosmetics is not only the consumer products, but we can think about the vitamin, mineral, dietary supplement, laundry care, home care, food industry. So overall, even though there are multiple regulation in order to get these products into the market, but whatever the regulation, the most important is the safety. So with this, I would like to conclude is that there are diverse career opportunity uh, in the toxicology field, including from simple toothpaste to the most complex medicinal products and from human health to the environment. So with this, I would like to hand over this presentation to Dr. Mori. Yeah, and so, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Shimpi. Uh, I want to take this one slide to talk about, okay, uh, I hope we uh, have inspired you to uh, think about toxicology, especially for the early career students as a career, but what can you do now? Okay, yeah, fine, you got inspired a little bit and you forgot about it and then you went about by your day. But, I mean, there are some actions that you can take now as a student. Uh, that, you know, network with the professional. On LinkedIn, Facebook, there are multitude of groups which are toxicology professional groups. There are some uh, association of scientists of Indian origin who are toxicologists. There are groups like that. So follow those groups, get in touch with professionals like myself, and there are so many others. And, you know, we are happy to give information to someone aspiring to be uh, following this career path. Professional organizations like Society of Toxicology have some very interesting programs for students coming from uh, countries like India uh, that they charge, uh, you know, they provide these funding scholarship or travel scholarships to get to the meeting in United States or anywhere else in the world. And even in India, there are some uh, CSIR has a toxicology branch uh, and uh, follow those websites. There is a wealth of content there. Then there are for the someone who is in M farm or thinking about PhD, there are toxicology certifications like American Board of Toxicology can certify you, European Registration of Toxicologist. And then, you know, okay, along with that, something that uh, it's very important, but we don't think about. Work on your written and verbal communication skills. Uh, I can tell you uh, like just the uh, uh, talent alone or, you know, is not going to get you too far. It's going to get your foot in the door. But you have to understand how much you progress and those salary bars I showed, right? That how much money can a person make, right? But once you're in that kind of job, it is your soft skills that help you a lot, depending on where you're going to lie in that bar, how far you go, communication skills, verbal and written communication skills, and the ability to convince someone uh, to, you know, do something. And I mean, toxicologists like myself and Dr. Shimpi, Dr. Shimpi specifically, they have to convince the uh, clinical scientists many times. So you have to do this test, that test. So there is a lot of interaction. So learn that. Learning the teamwork and leadership. Uh, those are very important things that you can do now and understand the basics of biology while you are a student, because that's going to help you in many, many fields. So and one last thing uh, we both wanted to share is the considerations for the BFARM curriculum. And this is, of course, our opinion, our two cents. Uh, I feel like, uh, uh, suppose, I, I remember, you know, that at least that was the background 12 years ago when I finished my bachelor's of pharmacy, that if somebody scores great in, say, GATE or GPAT or NIPER exam, someone who is a topper, the first thing we're going to say with the congratulations, oh, you know what? you scored great, you're going to get a SUTIX in NIPER or IICT or, you know, reputed university like say DY Patil or like that. So you're going to say that, like, okay, you can, you can go to SUTIX now because you have a great score. And because I feel that is because of the career scope of pharmaceutics and formulation in the Indian industry. However, we don't have to limit ourselves to that. And I guess what I'm trying to say is once we came here, 
and we realized that pharmaceutical sciences research and development is so vast especially in the innovation industry and that is coming to india slowly slowly india is uh, coming ahead on the track so i feel like uh, uh, i mean our curriculum can be focusing a bit more and there is pharmacology and toxicology is a combined discipline uh, i do believe as somani sir also mentioned in the beginning that toxicology is just as important if not more compared to pharmacology and i believe that uh, we can prep our students our b pharm curriculum is great like when i came from b pharm our background in biochemistry chemistry bio our background is amazing our b pharm course is one of the best in the world in india however uh, there is very little touch of research and the, some of these things can be tinkered around so we feel uh, like we can there can be a little bit more focus going forward and uh, so i would like to give an example here that i remember when i was in b farm and i remember that we had a experiment uh, in the pharmaceutics uh, lab making a lipstick and i know like it i it took me lot of the many attempts in order to make a proper lipstick but at that time when we were making a lipstick we were just thinking about how my lipstick consistency will be did we think how many ingredients are there and how they are going to impact on our toxic on our body another example i would really like to emphasize this here as i said right about the non having the cytotoxicity uh, sorry systemic toxicity uh, studies available in cosmetics right so for example nowadays people are going for more natural so when we think about when we study about pharmacognosy and that's good that in the when i did my m farm we did some of the natural products and its toxicity effect on the neuro development but if there are opportunity that we can think more broader in order to address the pharmacognosy while studying that subject so, so going forward what dr simpi is also trying to say is that disciplines like pharmacognosy are going to become very important in future because everybody wants to go towards natural products organic products we don't want to be exposed to chemicals we're going to try to avoid that going forward because the the planet is let's face it becoming polluted so that's why there is pharmacognosy and disciplines like that are going to get a lot of value and in general pharmaceutical sciences b pharmacy is going to become way more important in future and that's what we think and uh, that's what uh, again uh, thank you so much somani sir uh, jagtap sir for this opportunity uh, dy patel university college of pharmacy navi mumbai um and uh, everybody else who is listening uh, so let the questions flow in uh, don't think of a language as a barrier you can ask in any language uh, and type it in a chat box and we are happy to help uh, <clears throat> thank you uh, dr vijay and dr prajakta uh, definitely this session was uh, really uh, nice very different one and uh, i would like to ad uh, admit that uh, i agree with the uh, things that uh, during our graduation toxicology was very short portion and you have explored it uh, more than our uh, imagination uh, there are lots of questions are coming up so i will try to uh, ask each and every question but if some questions uh, i couldn't uh, ask then pardon me uh there is one question in connection with this what are the opportunities available to a toxicology researcher with post doctoral experience abroad returning to india it's a question by suhas okay uh thank you suhas for the question uh and i'd like to take this one so uh there are opportunities and as i mentioned the clinical uh, contract research organization cro is a booming field in toxicology in india uh, some uh, some names i can think about is the uh, advinus and then uh, there are a few other companies in southern part of india also some companies that work in collaboration uh, with the big pharma here like biocon bristol myers we work together in bangalore and there are many other opportunities especially nowadays with this pandemic ongoing and india is coming into focus you know half of the world whatever vaccine is going to save us from this is going to be made in india and that's a big deal that's a very very big deal that's a honorable thing and that is why i feel like there are opportunities uh, in india uh, not as many as you will see in western countries however they are growing okay uh, there is another question uh, from dr deepak gardde is there any instant raw test uh, to check toxicity of cosmetics before lab testing as sometimes skin rashes observed with some cosmetic product uh, i think dr prajakta can comment on it 
Uh, sure. So, uh, yeah, there are uh, some in vitro stress are available. Uh, as I mentioned, right, there are multiple battery of phase stars available for in vitro and even for the in silico modeling, as I, I briefly mentioned, but definitely I would be happy to talk offline uh, about what are the different modeling that we can consider while doing the in silico approaches. And for example, now I can give an example, again, the skin sensitization or the skin irritation. So there are the three different uh, techniques uh, in vitro uh, test, which are validated by OECD guideline. And those three uh, methods are basically based on the different key events that I mentioned, right? So one is having the electrophilic reactions with the skin. Another is by going into the body, what are the different dendritic cells that we have while sensitization? followed by the T cells, lymphoma. So all these in vitro methods are depending individual key events. So, and again, we need to integrate those together and put some QSR model and then come up with the potency as well as decision. And which is followed by the HRIPT, which is on the human uh, local toxicity. And okay. I'd like to add a little yeah. bit to that, saying that computational toxicology is also gaining traction in the pharmaceutical industry, not only in the consumer product and cosmetic industry. So uh, there is a lot of study early on before the laboratory testing begins. Okay, uh, there is one interesting question. I uh, really uh, want to take in Samruddhi Patil. Uh, she said, I am Samruddhi Patil from Nasi. I just love chemistry and want to become uh, something in toxicology field. She's in 10th. So I am really uh, glad that we have that audience as well. So please guide her. Oh, I, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, when I was in 10th, I didn't know what webinar was. I don't think webinar existed at the time, but mm -hmm. I'm glad you, that you joined and I'm glad that you're enjoying this content. But uh, what I'd like to say is that, yes, chemistry is one of the backbones of any scientific research. And that's why you follow your passion in chemistry, specifically I would guide you to organic chemistry uh, because that's what life is all about, right? Carbon, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen and oxygen and that's all we are. And that's why I feel like there is a lot of scope for chemistry mm -hmm. and there are some disciplines of toxicology that because of the time constraint we cannot even touch upon, like forensic toxicology or uh, there are toxicological chemists who work in this diagnostic lab. So there are other fields. Uh, besides, uh, we, we, we try to focus on the product side of toxicology. There is a whole other side, which is the sort of like a service side of toxicology. So there is a lot of scope for chemistry. Uh, do, uh, you know, keep both the groups in your uh, 11th and 12th. Try to, try to stay with both maths as well. Don't abandon maths because you like bio or don't do vice versa. Stay with both. And you, if you love chemistry so early on, you have a bright future. Yeah, I, I would like to support uh, Dr. More about maths because when I do the calculation for margin of safety, I have to consider so many mathematical factors, right? So that's also important. And as he mentioned, uh, I would like to just add one thing, like uh, this is not only the consumers that are the, uh, or the sick people who is taking medicine, but if we consider the safety of occupational health, Right, so when people are doing production of something, we have to consider their health also. So there are so many organizations who is working on the occupational health safety. So there are also an opportunity, if we know the chemistry background, you can also work for those organizations. Uh, the, the Professor Jagtap, there is one question on the Facebook uh, yeah. that uh, I, I was thinking of taking. So they, they're asking uh, Sonali Wagare, I wish to ask whether there are any short diploma courses after BPharm and MPharm. So after BPharm and MPharm, uh, basically once you have some little bit of a job experience, then there are courses available or there are certification exams available. Uh, and if you are looking specifically into say, continuing education sort of courses, so as I mentioned, Society of Toxicology or uh, uh, the CSIR websites, go on those websites, look for the content Society of Toxicology uh, has lots of courses, computational toxicology in silico, and they, they offer a variety of courses. There are some pre-recorded courses for three hours, six hours. You can sit through them, and if you need uh, help with the membership information and how to get those uh, discounts and sort of things on these things, do reach out to us uh, because there are ways in which, uh, without spending too much money or any, you can get around this content, so we can help. <clears throat> okay. 
um, there is one more question uh, who is a dear friend of us doctor uh, sorry deepak nipunge drug inspector he asked uh, how toxicology is helping regulatory decision making in usa oh that's a, well, a quite very important question and uh, a question with a broad answer but i'll try to be uh, as specific as possible so yes uh, us fda uh, and and thank you uh, drug inspector nipunge for asking that question it it's a basically it's a constant tussle between a tussle and a collaboration between pharmaceutical industry toxicologists and regulatory agencies they ask us question we give them answer they come back with more questions we have to prepare more answers and back and forth and back and forth until the drug gets to the market so there there is a big impact and in, in, in fact whatever the research is happening in the pharmaceutical industry the regulatory agencies are shaping it and i give one example of thalidomide that's very extreme example but even in the smaller smaller tests like every couple of years fda releases the revised guidelines and fda releases the draft guidelines gives to industry industry will be our comments on those guidelines and then they finalize the guidelines and couple of years later the science moves forward the technology moves forward and at that time again the new guidelines need to come so guidelines have been constantly updated you were not going to see a guideline that was made in say 2010 still applicable today it changes so dynamically and and if an iphone is released every year and people still buy it because there is something new there why not think about that in terms of drug safety right there is new technology new science developing and uh, it has to be keep an updated and it's the collaboration between industry and fda that helps us do that okay thank you uh one more question i um, harish ahire from nasi uh, he is pursuing his b farm final year and he wants to pursue ms in toxicology so can you suggest him a way sure uh, harish uh, uh, hello and uh, thank you for tuning in uh, so do uh, uh, can connect with us on linkedin and facebook and we can definitely discuss more um, uh, so you are in b farm last year that's a good time so what i basically say is focus on your basics of biology and there is a lot of toxicology in the curriculum of the last year b farm as per as i remember uh, so focus on that and when you go for m farm try to get into the research uh, of toxicology try to you know i would say try to go for m farm do don't have to after b farm if you get a job job experience is also going to help you but then if you directly go to jobs what happens is there is a ceiling that you hit and then you cannot move forward because of lack of degree so if you have m farm degree then your ceiling is higher if you are phd there is no ceiling so that's what i try trying to say that try to get into advanced education as much as you can and uh, i would suggest that focus on your basic skills and do reach out for more information okay <clears throat> thank you uh, so last question uh, from dr deepak gadde what is the prediction rate of in silico studies how much they are useful uh definitely that's a good questions and it's really evolving field uh, even though there are some studies nowadays are available but as i showed you uh, in my summary slide or uh, the evaluation opportunity it's saying that there are going to be by 2040 even uh, pharma industry uh, or the regulatory like the fda they are trying to get most of the studies which based on the in silico uh, modeling so i believe next 30 40 years we all can switch from in vivo in vitro to in silico model so okay. definitely they are useful but having said that there are limitation because in silico models is majority of the time based on the structure so when we know that's why i said when for example any natural product if we know the different phyto constituent of the natural product and if we are able to characterize the different structure then there are the opportunities in the in silico modeling where we can put those different structure all together and then they come up with the some of the values of any of the biological effects so it's definitely a evolving uh, field okay uh, so thank you there are no more questions now uh, and i am happy that we could able to answer address every question and uh, you answer every question uh, so thank you dr vijay more dr prajakta shimpi and along with them there is a third member who, is, who uh, she is not in screen uh, radha so thank you to all of you and also i would like to thank you dy patil university uh, 
एडमिशन डिपार्टमेंट टेक्निकल फी सदाकत सर एंड ऑल्सो ऑल पार्टिसिपेट सो विथ दिस नोट आई कंक्लूड टूडेज सेशन आई थिंक नाउ वी कैन एंड अप विथ दिस सेशन येस डॉक्टर विजय डॉक्टर प्राजक्ता you be safe yes <laughs> wear your mask <laughs> <laughs> yes thank you Bye. thank you all of you <laughs>